Hi, everybody. Happy Friday, May 29th. Meno male que e venerdì. Thank goodness it's Friday. Woo so today we are going to read Mr. Ferris and His Wheel. It was written by Catherine Gibbs Davis and Gilbert Ford drew the pictures. He's the illustrator. So we're going to read a book that's a little longer. So settle in for a little bit of a longer book today. And before we begin, let us say a nice Hail Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. I've got on my St. Joseph School 5K shirt. See, it's got that nice circle there. kind of reminds me of the Ferris wheel. And I wore my big round earrings today that are kind of like Ferris wheels, too. It's getting in the groove, right? All right. Mr. Ferris and His Wheel. Written by Catherine Gibbs, Dav Gibbs Davis and Gilbert Ford drew the pictures. Should be interesting. It was only 10 months until the next World's Fair, but everyone was still talking about the star attraction of the last World's Fair. At 81 stories, France's Eiffel Tower was the world's tallest building. Its pointy iron and air tower soared so high that visitors to the top could see Paris in one breathtaking sweep. Completed in 1889, the Eiffel Tower stood at 986 feet, surpassing America's Washington Monument to become the world's tallest man-made structure. I've never been up, but I would imagine it is glorious at the top of the Eiffel Tower. Now it was America's turn to impress the world at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. But what could outshine the famous French Tower? And who and who would build it? A nationwide contest was announced. Before TV and the internet, people from around the globe gathered at World's Fairs to share their different ways of life and new technologies. Tasty inventions such as hamburgers and Cracker Jack first appeared here. Contest drawings poured in from around the country, but most of the plans looked like the Eiffel Tower, only bigger. The fair judges said no to every last one. Was this really the best that American engineers could muster? To an ambitious young mechanical engineer, this contest was more than a dare. It was a matter of national pride. George Washington Gale Ferris, Jr., had already designed some of the country's biggest bridges, tunnels, and roads. He could never allow a French tower to overshadow America's World's Fair. Why hadn't the United States built the world's first skyscraper? George had seen the elegant steel frame rise ten stories high with his own eyes. Supported by a metal frame instead of solid walls, Chicago's home insurance building was the world's first skyscraper. Bird cages were the inspiration for the metal frame. George had an idea, an idea for a structure that would dazzle and move, not just stand still like the Eiffel Tower. Back at his drawing board in Pittsburgh, he and his engineering partner, William Gronau, measured and remeasured, 
a mistake of even an inch could bring their invention crashing down. What do you think they're going to build? George arrived in Chicago and made his case to the construction chief of the fair. The chief stared at George's drawings. No one had ever created a fair attraction that huge and complicated. The chief told George that his structure was so flimsy it would collapse. George had heard enough. He rolled up his drawings and said, You are an architect, sir. I am an engineer. George knew something the chief did not. His invention would be delicate looking and strong. It would be both stronger and lighter than the Eiffel Tower because it would be built with an amazing new metal, steel. George was a steel expert and his structure would be made of a steel alloy. Alloys combine a super strong mix of a hard metal with two or more chemical elements. The judges could not decide. Fall turned into winter as they dilly-dallied. In only four months the fair would open and it still had no star attraction. Finally, desperate, they agreed to give George's far-fetched idea a try but they would not give him one penny for the materials to build it. The clock was ticking. George dashed from bank to bank asking for help, but when he began describing his invention, lenders laughed, at him, laughed him into the street. So George used his own savings and convinced a few wealthy inventors to join him. Still short of money, he boldly went ahead and ordered the parts he needed from a dozen different steel mills. In January 1893, George's constru construction crew began work on the foundation. Shovels broke as the workers tried digging into the frozen ground. It was, the, it was one of the most brutally cold winters in Chicago's history. Blast! George's, George ordered his crew to dynamite the icy earth, but what they found underneath was scarier still. Quicksand, the deadly muck could suck man or machine under in seconds. The frost at the wheel site was three feet deep. The quicksand was 20 feet in depth and saturated with water, said Luther V. Rice, construction and operations manager. Pumps were kept running night and day to keep out the water and live, and, and live stream had to be used to throw the sand and broken stone. and live steam, sorry. George and his brave workers kept frantically digging. Finally, 35 feet down, they hit solid ground. They planted two huge steel towers deep into the earth, bolted them to crossbars of steel, and poured in cement to hold it all in place. Then they carefully lowered a 70-ton axle with fittings, the weight of a Mongol locomotive train between them. This sturdy structure would hold a gigantic invention steady in even the strongest Chicago winds. At 45 feet long, the axle, a metal rod, was the largest piece of steel ever forged, and a boy helped to hammer it into shape at the Bethlehem Ironworks. As time grew shorter, freight trains from all over the country chugged into the fairgrounds, loaded with more than 100,000 parts. 
Workers hurried to fit all the pieces together like a giant Lego toy. Hammers pounded nonstop in the breathless race to finish. Responsible for the wheel's many structural details, George's partner was losing hope. It's undignified. Stand back, dear. It might collapse. Betcham the wind will blow Ferris's folly into the lake. Nope, it'll fall first. It's going up. It's going up way the fast. It's going up way the fast? I don't know. They say that Ferris has wheels in his head. Frequently I was diagnosed and ready to frequently I was discouraged and ready to give up. But through the encouragement of Mr. Ferris, work was always resumed. William Grunau. Remember William Grunau was his partner. Finally, with only two months left, the last section was bolted into place, and there stood a perfect, enormous circle, 834 feet in circumference, rising 265 feet above the ground, and designed to, and designed to move with the precision of the smallest watch. It looked exactly how George had first imagined, it back as a boy on his ranch in Nevada. Living near the shore, of Nevada's Carson River, George had often watched the water wheel turn around and around. Many times he had imagined shrinking to the size of one of his toy soldiers and hitching a ride up, up, up and away in one of its wooden buckets. Something so creative, right? We've all enjoyed a Ferris wheel, haven't we? Still, the biggest test was yet to come. The monster wheel had to spin, and George's elegant passenger cars still had to be hung. The tireless crew worked day and night to attach them. Each was the size of a living room, with enormous picture windows and 40 velvet seats. George's wheel worked like a bicycle wheel, but what both are supported by shiny, flexible rods called spokes, and the wheel, as the wheel turns, the spokes work together to share the weight. These are called tension wheels. Now that is some Ferris wheel. Imagine sitting in that seat. On June 21st, 1893, opening day finally arrived. 2,000 people gathered as flags waved. George took the stage and dedicated his wheel to the noble profession of engineering. Then George's wife presented him with a beautiful golden whistle. George and his wife stepped proudly into car number one, followed by their numerous, by their nervous, but excited guests. Uniformed guards closed and locked the door. Would the wheel work? George blew the golden whistle. 2,000 tons of steel began to turn around as the soft clanking of a large chain drove the mighty machine. Up, 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 the car quietly floated above the mud and noise. Two steam engines, an extra one in case one broke, made the wheel turn. George had hidden them under the wooden platform where riders boarded. Look at how shocked they are. They never believed it could happen. As the car was lifted higher, everyone rose from the velvet seats and crowded to the windows. Spread out before them was a dizzying sweep of the fairgrounds, the city of Chicago, and sparkling Lake Michigan, and even glimpses of three faraway states. Below, more cars were loaded, and after the people had gone, two times around and had 20 glorious airborne minutes in motion, powerful brakes brought the wheel to a whisper soft stop. When the conductor called all out, everyone begged to go around again. The wheel is safe. The news raced through the fairgrounds, through the city of Chicago and across the country.
All summer, visitors from around the world traveled to Chicago's World's Fair. It didn't matter whether one was a senator, a farmer, a boy, or a girl. Everyone wanted to take a spin on the magnificent wheel. Adventurous couples asked to get married on it. On hot, steamy days, the wheel was the perfect place to escape up, up, up into the cooling breezes. All you needed was 50 cents. During the 19 weeks the wheel was in operation, 1.5 million passengers rode it. It revolved more than 10,000 times, withstood gale force winds and storms, and it did not need one repair. At night, George Ferris's wheel became a magical glowing circle with 3,000 electric light bulbs. Another brand new invention. As the queen of the midway made its stately rotation, so did the seasons. Soon a fall chill filled the air and fair visitors began to thin out. In the late 1800s, homes were still lit with candles and kerosene lamps. The Chicago World's Fair helped reassure people that electricity was safe. At night, farmers and sailors from as far away as 40 miles could see the wheel's spectacular blaze of lights. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Can you even imagine being there? Being one of the first to ride or just riding it that summer? And then the lights! My goodness! On October 26th, 1893, just before midnight, the immense, twinkling, spinning circle slowed to its final stop. The Chicago World's Fair was over. George had called his creation a monster wheel, but his inventors renamed it its but his inventors renamed it after its inventor, the Ferris wheel. I'm sorry, but his investors renamed it after its inventor, the Ferris wheel. The Chicago Fair, or the White City, inspired two more magical places. The Emerald City, in the classic children's book, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, by L. Frank Baum, and Disneyland. Walt Disney's father was a construction worker on the fair. He told his son stories about the dreamlike city he had helped build and young Walt grew up to build famous amusement parks that stay open all year round. Visitors returned to their homes to tell the story of the world's greatest ride, and before long, copies of the Ferris wheel began popping up around the world. In 1894, the next Ferris wheel appeared in California on a cliff overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Lit up at night, it was the first landmark seen by ships finding their way home. Can you see it right here? Right up there? There's a ship, and there's the Ferris wheel. Today, Ferris wheels are the most familiar and beloved carnival ride at state fairs and amusement parks. A ride on one still feels like flying to the moon. And oh, 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 the view! Woohoo! Since 1893, there have been over eight tallest ever Ferris wheels, and the race continues. The current record holder for the world's tallest is the Singapore Flyer at 541 feet. And the views are beautiful when, when you get on a Ferris wheel, aren't they? You can see forever. And that's it. Mr. Ferris and His Wheel. It was written by Katherine Gibbs Davis and Gilbert Ford. Drew the pictures. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Maybe someday you can be an inventor and invent something fabulous for, for another World's Fair. So, today's Friday. We won't have a book tomorrow, but we will have a book on Sunday. So, Saturday we take a day off, and then Sunday we'll have another book. 
So remember to read, 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 and build those books, right? Create your own book. Pictures to words, words to pictures, however you want to do it is perfect. And I hope you have a fabulous Friday. Enjoy it, the first day of our weekend. And have a great Saturday. Enjoy, 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 enjoy. And always remember the most important part of the day. Jesus loves you. Watchy. Ciao.